Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome on this lovely autumn day. We are delighted to have so many of you join us for Historical Trauma and Transformation's first webinar of the year. My name is Malika Furi, and I will be your host. You are welcome to introduce yourselves using the chat function. It's always good for us to know who is here with us today. For today's event in particular, there was tremendous interest with people from over 20 countries attending, including people from Africa, Europe, North America, and also Australia. So this, of course, attests to the social relevance of our topic today. I also want to let you know that our webinars um, will run on the second Wednesday of every month, and these updates will be posted on our website regularly. Also, um, the full recording of today's event will be posted on our website within the next week if you miss any part of it. So our next webinar is on the 14th of April. It's a book launch for the edited collection Post-Conflict Hauntings, Transforming Memories of Historical Trauma. So this brings me to the theme of today's seminar, which is broadly on social justice and gender, as it also coincides with Women's History Month and International Women's Day. The project of decolonial feminist psychology is to interrogate and move beyond knowledge conceptually framed by white, heterosexual, middle-class male experience. Central to this project is working towards forms of social justice to disrupt oppressive systems of power. And uh, for our lineup today, we have four distinguished guests, two presenters and two respondents. I just want to um, give you a quick roadmap for the session. So in a moment, I will hand over to my colleague, Samantha van Skalkbeek. She is our resident gender expert, and Samantha also put together this terrific lineup. So Samantha will introduce our speakers and facilitate the discussion. I want to encourage you to already post your questions during the presentations using the Q&A function, not the chat function. And then if everything goes well, we should have at least 20 minutes at the end to engage with these questions from the audience. So um, that's it from me. I um, look forward very much to today's session and I'm handing over to you, Samantha. Thank you very much, uh, Malika. I would like to, to take this opportunity to, on behalf of the Gender Desk of um, Studies in Historical Trauma and Transformation, to just thank the four panelists for so graciously accepting our invitation to be here today, to discuss some of your insights and your experiences, and to talk a little bit about what social justice really means in the context of um, the important work that you are doing. And um, yes, as, as Milika just told us, there are around about 300 people um, registered for, for this webinar, which, which really does attest to the value um, of the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. I'll move to introduce our first speaker, Professor Floretta Boonzaya. Um, Professor Boonzaya um, is at the psychology department at UCT, and she's also the deputy director um, she's, the, she's a deputy director of the hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa. She's noted for her work in feminist, critical and post-colonial psychologies, subjectivity in relation to race, gender and sexuality, and gender-based violence. She serves on the board of Mosaic Training, Service and Healing Center for Women, and that's in Cape Town, and also um, the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Prof Bunzai is also an executive committee member of the Sexuality and Gender Division of the Psychological Society of South Africa, and she's published extensively two of her most recent co-edited books are Decolonial Feminist Community Psychology, published by Springer in 2019, and the second, Men, Masculinities and Intimate Partner Violence, which was published by Routledge last year. Thank you so much, Professor Bunzai. We really look forward to your talk. Thank you, Samantha. 
Um, I'll give um, Unison a moment to begin sharing um, the presentation, but um, I'll start off by saying good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, and thank you to colleagues in uh, historical um, uh, trauma studies um, for the invitation to speak today. So I begin my um, talk today with a few questions about the discipline of psychology, my discipline. How does one locate oneself in a discipline that has had deep complicities with colonization, enslavement and apartheid? And how do you feel at home in a discipline where women raised as you are, are described in published papers as being always at risk um, and as um, having an increased risk for low cognitive function, for example? How do you locate yourself in a discipline where poor people, black people, people like you and like those you love are positioned and represented in particularly disparaging and dehumanizing ways, in ways that emphasize lack and deficit. And so how do you work within a discipline like that? Next slide, please, Unison. Uh, today, I want to talk about the hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa, um, located in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cape Town, and about the ongoing conversations we have had about the possibilities of creating feminist decolonial spaces and modes of knowledge production. Next slide, please. The Hub for Decolonial Feminist Psychologies in Africa was launched um, on the 11th of April in 2018 with myself and my colleague, Professor Shose Kesi as co-directors. The project was funded through the initiative of the then Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research, Professor Mamogheti Pakeng. Thematic areas that would be undertaken in the hub would cover questions of institutional racism and sexism, the identity-related impact of colonization, slavery and apartheid, intersectional identities and oppressions, institutional cultures, spatial justice, transgenerational trauma, and questions of reparations and reconciliation. These and other topics are explored through our teaching, symposia, public engagements, and through our writing and research. Next slide, please. In June 2018, we hosted our first colloquium. At that colloquium, our late and very dear colleague, Professor Harry Garuba, reminded us that decolonization means putting the needs of the disenfranchised first, putting these needs front and center of knowledge production. Decolonizing our disciplines entails slipping into a place of a disciplinary void, a place where one's discipline does not necessarily have the tools to free itself from the conceptual problems that it has created. Mm -hmm. Being in such a space gives one the means to see the possibility and impossibility of centering questions that concern you and the degree to which you are able to let those questions drive you. Within our discipline, this void can be understood as a conceptual deficit, one that has made us aware that we need new ideas and new ways of working to address the situation we had observed in both our classrooms and our, in our research. Our discipline has managed to alienate us from ourselves. Most fundamentally, we have observed how our discipline has increasingly alienated our students from themselves and from the life worlds that they occupy outside of the academy. Next slide, please. We've written at length about how psychological um, knowledge has historically served the interest of dominant groups in society. Psychology has been critiqued for its complicity during colonization and apartheid, and for contributing to reinforcing ideologies of white supremacy. Other feminist scholars, many um, are, who are in the same room today, um, have pointed out how psychology as a discipline has maintained an androcentric focus and worked to maintain a heteropatriarchal status quo, where the white heterosexual middle class able-bodied a male experience is the position from which generalizations and theorizations have been produced and cast as normative. Psychology has also played a role 
in regulating uh, behavior and constructing what is considered to be normal, as I've said. We can see this in the ways in which the experiences of poor women, black women, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex populations have not only been written about, but the ways in which they have been deeply pathologized. So all of this has profound consequences for the lives of people about whom psychology theorizes. Next slide, please. The hub for decolonial feminist psychologies in Africa is a transdisciplinary space and one that also challenges disciplinarity um, that advances pluriversal knowledges about human life and ways of understanding and being in the world. We aim to disrupt political processes of inferioriz inferiorization and control. The hub exists in two forms. First, as a discursive space where knowledge about the psychologies of people from our continent and beyond could be theorized, where we could also counter some of the alienating conceptions of African subjects who are othered by Western hegemonic ways of theorizing. Secondly, uh, and importantly, the hub exists as a physical space where postgraduate students of psychology can engage their peers and us as decolonial feminists invested in emancipatory forms of both practice and the theorization of psychological knowledge. It involves taking up space, physical space in a psychology department, as well as in the discipline. We intentionally designed both these instantiations of the hub to be student-centered. We particularly sought to reimagine the center by privileging the life worlds of the very same people who have been relegated to marginal spaces by our discipline. The student-centered approach is evident both in how we enact our teaching and in the forms of learning that emerge from the space. So one example has been the lunch hour sessions on Fridays that have been somewhat dis disrupted now um, since going online. But these have been our most conducive means of practicing a feminist decolonial learning space where students have taken responsibility for the learning that takes place in these sessions. And the, the effect of the sense of ownership of the space has drawn in students and faculty from disciplines beyond psychology and beyond our university. Um, and students have also expressed the view that the hub offers them a, res a respite from having to defend their blackness uh, because of its decolonial and feminist orientation. Next slide, please. So how do we address, um, so to address the how question, right? How do we go about doing the work of producing um, decolonial feminist knowledges? It's worth starting here with Hussein Bulhan, a Somalian psychologist who talked about metacolonization to describe the colonial project and its afterlives. Bulhan suggests that in order to decolonize psychology in its knowledge and practice, we need to refocus the discipline's attention in some of the following ways. Sorry, I think I'm supposed to be on the previous slide, um, um, Unison, yes. So Bulhan um, talks about a shift from individual to collective well-being, right? An example, what might be to think about the question of collective historical trauma, right? Psychology tends to individualize um, questions of trauma. What, but what kinds of collective and traumatic memories and histories do we share? And what does this mean for our healing and well-being? Questions that, as I've said, have not been addressed in psychology. Psychology has also had an obsession with instinct. How can we begin instead to talk about human needs and humanity? And this is part of the humanizing effort of, of feminist decolonial work. Moving from questions of adjustment to empowerment, um, rather than adjusting to inequality, um, and the destruction left by the afterlives of slavery and colonization, how do we begin to talk about empowerment? How do we think about human agency and capacity and questions of, of power and empowerment? And this of course centers questions of social just, justice. Um, decolonization according to Bulhan also involves thinking about people not as passive victims of their circumstances, but rather as self-determining actors, as people with agency, and with the capacity to understand inequality and to find the resources they need to change their circumstances. And that means also that we need to find ways, new ways of working with um, people rather than doing research on. Next slide, please. 
So beyond what Bulhan is saying, um, what are some of the other key ideas and questions in building a feminist decolonial praxis? Um, these ways of thinking and questions derived from feminist um, research and from decolonial research, these are some of the ways um, that we've thought about our modes of engagement in the hub. Um, and I'll pick up, I won't be able to go through all of them in the interest of time, but um, pick up on some of them later um, in the presentation. Questions about who produces knowledge, who represents the discipline, um, who teaches, right? Um, to do feminist decolonial work, you have to begin to talk about building sustainable and equitable collaborations and alliances and solidarities across different struggles. And I think recent struggles in our context has shown us that uh, building solidarities and alliances are important. Um, it's thinking about who, who knowledge is created for um, and, and, and in this going beyond the, the academy. It involves questions of disruption. How do we speak back to colonial narratives? How do we counter epistemic accepted colonial knowledges about people? It's, it also involves thinking carefully about ethics. Yeah, I've said ethics is everything. Um, what kinds of knowledge are we putting out there about different groups of people? You know, those are ethical questions, questions about how particular kinds of people, kinds of people are represented in our research is an ethical question. Um, the kinds of questions we ask and what that says and what that implies about how we understand people, um, those are ethical issues. So it's ex expanding notions of what um, is considered to be ethical ways of thinking and doing research. And then humanizing ourselves and others to counter the alienation, um, multiple pluriversal knowledges, multiple ways of knowing, talking about damage-centered versus active, activist-oriented research. Um, Tuck and Wang talk about how academics have built their careers on centering, on retelling stories of other people's pain. Um, and so we need to counter that in thinking about, you know, what, what is the research doing and whose story is it repackaging and in the interests of whom? Um, so, I, as I've said, I won't be able to go through all of them, but I'll pick up on some of them in, in, the, in the following slides. Um, next slide, please. So, in terms of thinking about who represents the discipline, who produces knowledge and who teaches, opening up and creating space in the discipline is important in terms of changing the face of knowledge production in the academy. This is necessary for a decolonial feminist project. There can be no decolonization of our discipline without attending to what is considered um, the canon. By this we mean that um, if there is to be a decolonization of psychology, uh, classrooms in African universities beyond pedagogic um, interventions, there ought to be a decolonization of the materials that we present to our students and what we um, see as legitimate or valid scholarship. And this means actively encouraging our students to contribute towards psychology scholarship um, that is produced in the academy. Um, towards addressing the transformation of psychology classrooms, we've invited our senior postgraduate students to, to collaborate with us on, on our teaching. Um, in part, this involves them teaching with us and on their own in our undergraduate and postgraduate classes. And this achieves two things. Students are exposed to the most contemporary research that situates itself in a, as, as decolonial feminists. And they get to interact with emerging academics who, whose work indicates the possibilities of a transformed decolonial feminist psychology. Next slide, please. Building solidarities, collaborations, and alliances are fundamental, um, as I've said, to the work of a feminist decolonial agenda. The hub as a physical space embraces an activist decolonial aesthetic and praxis for psychological work in South Africa, Africa and the diaspora. Within the space of the hub, we've engaged in dialogues around issues of gender-based violence, racialized violence, the stigmatization and oppression of poor and working class communities and methodologies that pro promote the participation and collective action of marginalized groups. These dialogues are not only with our colleagues in different departments, both within our institution, um, but also with colleagues across the continent and wider publics and, and activists. 
As one example, we collaborated with UWC Women's and Gender Studies Department to host a two day event on art and activism as scholarship for gender and social justice. And this brought together artists, activists, scholars, and scholars to counter dominant scholarship and pedagogies on gendered violence. From this perspective, it is also important to think carefully about how we in the academy engage with civil society and other organizations. How do we engage respectfully with the knowledges that they bring? How do we work against the extractive models that those working in NGO spaces have come to expect of academic researchers? How do we center research questions that are driven by the needs of the communities that we engage with? And how do we think reflexively and carefully about the power that we hold as academic researchers aligned to particular institutions? Next slide, please. Who are we producing knowledge for? We've held screenings and debates on social issues that are of concern to South African publics. All of these have been geared towards making space for pluriversal knowledges about human life, life and ways of being in the world. Our students host and facilitate discussions on issues related to the work that they do. Many of these discussions are open to the public and we have found that including activists, social movements and wider South African publics has entrenched a culture of understanding that the, the academy cannot be the loudest uh, voice in issues of social change. Next slide, please. Speaking back to colonial ways of doing and knowing means that the project of disruption must always be front and center. We've sought to disrupt the narratives that emerge out of academic scholarship by centering questions that trouble the tropes and the stereotypes on particular racialized subjects prevalent in both our society and in the academy. Researchers, for example, gone on to disrupt both popular and academic discourse on racialized subjects constructed as colored, identifying and challenging colonial tropes about so-called colored men and their associations with crime and violence. This work, also fundamentally counters epistemic violence that silences histories of dispossession, historical trauma, ongoing erasure, stigmatization and violence. Our students and our research associates have presented emancipatory ways of researching gendered violence, gendered subjectivity, race and place. Some of these talks have, have looked at representations of townships among wealthy tourists from Northern countries, showing how neoliberal and colonial discourses operate together to produce sanitized representations of townships that both obscure inequalities between poor residents and wealthy tourists from the global north and depoliticize issues like poor infrastructure in townships. Next slide, please. Some further research questions um, uh, or the research and questions that our students and us have been engaged in include the following, how has the popular and academic narrative on gender-based violence been racialized? How do we disrupt this racialization of violence? And, and by the racialization of gender-based violence, I mean the idea that gender-based violence is constructed not only in popular imagination, but in academic discourse as a poor black problem. So we've gone on to begin to think about how do we study whiteness? in relation to questions of gender-based violence? And how do we point to particular kinds of violences that might be silenced? Given the racialization of academic discourse on gender-based violence, what, what about white men and violence, for example? What are the experiences of violence of black women by virtue of them being black and women? What are black students' experiences at, of historically white spaces? How can we begin to bring questions of historical trauma through recognition of slavery, colonization, and apartheid into our thinking about gendered violence and its persistence in the present moment? How can we think more expansively about ethics that goes beyond disciplinary tick box exercises, but includes decisions about what it is we research, who we research, and the kinds of questions we ask, as I've said, about particular groups of people? Countering the Eurocentric gaze, what kinds of questions might we begin to ask about researching the global north from our location and not the other way around as it normally happens? Here in particular, we have students engaged in research 
For example, with African, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender asylum seekers in the UK, as well as research on white supremacy in Denmark. These are just some of the ways in which we've been building feminist decolonial psychology in our teaching and practice. And in closing, it's important to note that the work must always be recognized as unfinished and evolving, that there's so many more questions and ways of thinking about um, doing feminist decolonial work. Um, so it remains unfinished business. Um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, this is a plug uh, on our session this coming Friday, um, where some of our students in the hub will be talking about what feminist decolonial research looks like um, from their perspective and from the perspective of the work that they've been engaged in. Uh, and then the next slide, um, just to say thank you all. If you'd like to be invited to the um, to the seminar on Friday, you can email the hub the for, for feminist decolonial psychology at the email address. And thank you all. I look forward to the discussion and engagement. Thank you very much, Munzaya, um, for a really stimulating talk. Uh, this idea of first and foremost, humanizing oneself and humanizing others is so important, as you say, on on a theoretical level, on an ethical level, and also as, as you are doing so beautifully um, on an embodied level, carving spaces with students, spaces of learning and critique at the, the hub for feminist decolonial psychologies. I can see that there are, are questions and comments coming in. We're going to leave um, the, the, the questions to the end, um, but we, we are documenting the comments coming in on your talk. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Prof. Puleng uh, Sakhalo. Uh, she is an Associate Professor of Social and Community Psychology at the University of South Africa. Her areas of specialization include community psychology, social psychology, and gender and feminism in psychology. Her research work and her publications cover a wide range of areas, including gendered experiences of women in various aspects of life, historical trauma as well, critical participatory research practices and knowledge production and decolonization. She is a member of the South African Young Academy of Sciences and the current president of the Forum of African Psychology. Thank you very much, Professor Sakhano. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start with a brief reflection based on uh, a paper that I published with a colleague, Michelle Fine. Um, in, this recent, in this recent paper that we published, we reflect on the numerous media headlines we saw at the beginning of the lockdown in 2020. And this was from the UK and India, the United States, here in South Africa, in Mexico, and in Russia, announcing that gender-based violence is on the rise in COVID. So we argue in this paper that this topic has erupted as if by surprise across the globe and exposed just under the covers of COVID. We wanted to trouble this shock and question the unprecedented crisis and ask for whom is this crisis new? COVID made painfully clear today that when the world is unsafe and the state fails, home is the space where dependencies, pain, fear and existential terrors flee. Home is the very space that everyone was confined to during the hard lockdown. Home, the original carved out space for privatization. We look at home and understand it as a private space. The home and intimate hetero and child rearing relations constitute a swelling and throbbing affective zone where care and solidarities power and brutality, 
property and bodily rights and violations can be found. So it's a complicated space where these multiplicities always uh, happen and take place at the same time. Here in South Africa, Black women's humanity is always in question as they continue to be brutalized, to be sidelined, to be ignored and violated like their existence does not matter. Gender-based violence and femicide continue to be the perpetual challenges confronting women, girls, and transgendered people on a daily basis. One needs to look at the statistics to see this. Pumla Gola coined the phrase, the female fear factor, which speaks to fear being consciously and subconsciously instilled in women all the time where they have to regulate their movement, their words, the way they dress, and how they carry themselves in the world. Fear to walk alone in the street, fear to use public transport, and fear to be out alone at night. This means women have to always surveil and regulate their very existence. This gender problematic needs to be understood holistically and within a historical landscape. The Ugandan feminist scholar Sylvia Tamale reminds us that no African woman can shield herself from the broad negative and gendered legacies left behind by forces such as colonialism, imperialism, and globalization. The colonial system took control over women's status in society, their health and the intimate relations between men and women. At a structural level, the politicians always held a twisted moral compass directed towards women. One needs to look at the despicable treatment of women who were detained during the apartheid regime. Their womanhood was used against them to shame, to intimidate, and to publicly humiliate them. Uh, a Kenyan scholar, Marilyn Osome, uh, suggests that colonial rule played a decisive part in the pacification of women by engineering a set of ideas about women that compelled them into specific roles. Colonial officials transformed women's agency re-inscribing them and their social roles with a passivity that belied the highly proactive and transformative nature of women's activities. So when women are scolded for wearing a skirt that is too short, when a woman is asked why she was walking alone in the dark, there are these are inscriptions of women on women's lives, on their bodies, denying them agency. Understanding these challenges from a historical context that includes colonialism is critical for us to start making sense of and imagining possible transformational agendas. And as Floretta indicated in her talk, that within the discipline of psychology, when we're looking at women's experiences in their communities, in society, in their lives, in their intimate relationships, often they are looked at as victims, as helpless. And the, the challenges that they are confronted with is always looked at in isolation. And this historical landscapes, the role that colonialism has played uh, into how we are, where we are right now, and the challenges that confront women in society are often not part of theorization within psychology. And for me, this is where decolonial feminism becomes very useful. Decolonial feminism forces us to look back at the role of colonialism, slavery, and apartheid, and how all of these played and continue to play a role in how we do and engage notions of gender and how we define the private and public. Looking back at the process of colonization assists us to make meaning of what it means to be gendered, to be classed and to be racialized beings. The imposition of Western gender order dehumanizes the, the colonized people and it perpetuates what uh, South American scholar Maria Lugones calls the coloniality of gender. Lugones reminds us that it was colonialism which introduced many genders and gender itself 
as a colonial concept and mode of organizing of relations of production, property relations, cosmologies, and ways of knowing who can produce knowledge, who's got the right to be uh, the knowledge pr producer and who is the receiver of this knowledge. As the colonized black women are subject to the most extreme sexual and gender violence attended to the human dehumanizing practice of the coloniality of gender. So while we might speak of the uh, colonialism era as being behind us, coloniality continues. That, so that is the power, right? The, the patriarchal power and, and the ways in which colonialism affected the, 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 the structures in our society continues today, even though it might not be named as colonialism. So hence this whole idea of coloniality. So the coloniality of gender persists. The violence happens at both the macro and micro level in the home, in the street where we walk, in the workplaces and various other, other spaces that women occupy. So a decolonial feminist approach asks us to take these intersections seriously, intersections of history, intersections of politics, the private, the public, and to acknowledge that gendered violations do not happen in isolation. It is often not an individualist experience as it affects the collective at the same time. So collective suffering, collective trauma is something that is critical for us to think about when we theorize gender, when we theorize trauma uh, within psychology in particular. It asks us, decolonial feminism, to shift away from only positioning suffering as an inward experience, but both inward and outward at the same time. The discipline of psychology has generally been guilty of theorizing mostly from an individual perspective uh, and often pathologizing the individual, often ignoring the importance of context, almost as if human beings are separated from their environment and the ways in which the environment affects their very existence. A decolonial feminist psychology, therefore, proposes a radical shift from the linear and binary modes of thinking that present gender and gendered violence in binary ways. We need to acknowledge that who we are now as gendered beings is as a result of the colonial past, which has pitched people against one another. The colonial state not only categorized men and women in specific gendered ways, but also created different axes of privilege and power in relation to this. Uh, who's got access to education? Um, who's got access to, to, to power and, and powerful positions in society? Who's got access to, to property, to land? All of these are interlinked to, to, to our history in terms of what colonialism did in our, in our society. Lugones again uh, continues to call for an approach of gender that is not individualistic, but considers gender in relation to the community. Gender is understood here as not fixed. Part of the task of resistance of a coloniality of gender involves shifting from such an individualistic approach that separates our sense of being and doing from our communities. Communities rather than individuals enable the doing one does with someone else, not in individualistic isolation. A decolonial feminist community is oriented or it would recognize the role and meaning of community to individual well being and see these two modes of connection as inseparable the individual as part of the community, the community as being composed of individuals who form and make up the whole. Understanding how gender structures itself in our everyday lives requires an engagement with social, political, and psychosocial dimensions of gender in terms of such connections. We need to ask within the context of South Africa. 
where do these men who brutally abuse and kill women come from? What is the role of communities in responding to challenges of gender-based violence? We need to shift from only looking at the individual, the man who commits this crime, but engage the ways in which we are socialized, how our communities produce such people, how structural violence breeds violent citizenry, and how colonialism and apartheid dehumanized people and created psychologically wounded people whose humanity was stripped from them. We need to look at these challenges while at the same time holding perpetrators accountable for their actions. We are very quick to treat the symptoms. We arrest the perpetrators, take them to jail, only to release them to the very same communities where they came from. While the real issue remains firmly rooted, so we deal with the symptoms and not really engage what the problem is. Imagining a way to respond to gender-based violence has to take seriously the role played by patriarchy, capitalism, coloniality, and historical baggage that our communities continue to carry. So what are some of the ways we can do this work? In the, in the midst of despair, of desperation, of uncertainty, there continues to be glimmers of hope. The work done by activists and everyday women in the homes and communities offer radical possibilities on how we can imagine confronting the crisis of gendered violence. It is important for communities to pull together to assist one another and hold space for each other. There continues to be collective efforts that serve to cater for the well being of fellow human beings, and these are critical points of possible healing. Psychologists, in particular, and the academy more broadly, are sides of responsibility. And as sides of responsibility, they have to always tie the symptoms to histories to name these ruptures and also to theorize the idea of home as both a space of care, but also acknowledging that it's also a space of violence, deeply affected by market and state. We need to mobilize with communities under siege. So as I move towards conclusion, I, I draw briefly from, from my own work and in linking to how um, practically do the decolonial feminist work. In my work, I draw from uh, a visual methodology framework called uh, uh, embroidery. Uh, I believe that knowledge production is an ongoing process that happens during moments of encounters with one another. So I work with a community of women. Most of my research work is embedded within the community um, and, and, and working together with co the community as sites of knowledge productions, community members as knowers and acknowledging that knowledge that is produced within the community. So I work with a community of women who's, who use their knowledge of making embroideries to tell and share their complex lived experiences. Um, so using embroidery as a visual methodology, we, 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 we find the possibility to foster participation where knowledge is not only produced by an individual, but by a collective with similar experiences. The making of personal and collective embroideries empower and give voice to those who may otherwise not be heard. They offer a different approach that takes seriously the women as knowers, as I've just indicated. The women that I work with acknowledge their suffering and various forms of violence that they experience. However, they at the same time show how they resist and build survival strategies through collective remembering and reimagining. So the making of embroideries shows in practice how decolonial feminism can be possible through advocating for love and care where one's humanity is embraced first and foremost. For me, this process of making embroideries is a form of speaking back and also form of decolonizing. Decolonization 
is a humanizing project, one that deems important the creation for a space for healing. It requires us to acknowledge people's woundedness before attempting to work with and alongside one another. Using a decolonial approach means being committed to producing research that documents social injustice, that recovers subjugated knowledges, that helps create spaces for the voices of the silenced to be expressed and listened to, and that challenge racism, colonialism, and gender oppression. I would like to close with a quote uh, from Professor Matsinia, one of the African scholars, who in his response to gender-based violence stated that the fight against gender-based violence will remain an exercise in futility driven by rhetoric if urgent steps are not taken to revisit and restructure the education systems in Africa in such a way that their contents are suffused with African values which project the important role of women, as well as their age-long respect for women in African societies. And with that, I thank you. Back to you, Samantha, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sakhalo, for sharing your work and your insights in the, the beautiful and in fact, even almost poetic way that you do. We um, are looking forward to, to reading the paper that you mentioned on COVID and, and gender-based violence. And hopefully you can share that um, with us also in the comments section. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. I would also like to, to remind um, attendees of the webinar that they are, are welcome to um, post um, their questions that we will address shortly. Um, and, and to do so in, in, in the, the Q&A um, function. Thank you very much. We're moving on to our respondents um, and we have two uh, respondents today who will reflect on some of the ideas um, that have been covered by the two talks. The first is Professor Katriana McLeod and the second is Professor Peace Kigua. Katriana McLeod is Saatchi Chair of Critical Studies in Sexualities and Reproduction and Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University still known as Rhodes. She is Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Feminism and Psychology. We will start off um, with you, Prof, um, Prof. McLeod, and then following that, um, we will go straight into Prof. Professor Peace Kigua who is an Associate Professor in Psychology at the University of the Witwatersrand. Her research interests include gender and sexuality, critical race theory, critical social psychology, and teaching and learning. She is the current Chair of the Sexuality and Gender Division of the Psychological Society of, of South Africa. So thank you to both respondents, um, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Professor McLeod. You're still on, on mute. In a, uh, yeah. Unison, will you put up my slide? While he's, okay, thank you, there it comes up. Um, the first one. Thank you. Let me just start off by expressing my thanks um, in being invited to, to, to comment on these two scholars' input. These are, are, are two people, um, along with the other discussants, whose work I have read and admired and relied upon um, for many years. So it's a privilege to be able to just speak to some of the ways in which um, you know, the, the, the remembrances, things that these presentations reminded me of as the um, speakers were going through their presentations. Of course, I can only pick up on a couple of strands. Before I start, I just want to alert the, 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 the audience to these, I think, are two, uh, three uh, very important recent texts um, on decolonial feminisms. Um, the one is, has been mentioned already, edited by Floretta Buenzaya and Taran Fenica, Decolonial Feminist Community Psychology. And then another special issue on um, uh, 
uh, Decolonial Feminisms, uh, edited again by Floretta Shosi Kesi and Amelie uh, Ravin. Um, and you can see the list of articles there. And then the final one is Feminism and Psychology has also done a special issue on feminisms and decolonizing psychology. Um, and there you can see the, the, the list of contents. I've used the, um, this last one, the Feminism and Psychology uh, um, special issue, the editorial that I wrote there with Sunil Bhatia and Wen Liu to structure my responses to these um, presentations. What we did in that editorial is that we took the inputs from various scholars whose work appears in the special issue to, in a grounded fashion, start to think through what are the, some of the principles or guiding principles uh, that uh, could be thought of in terms of feminist decolonizing psychology. So if you can go through to the next slide in unison. Thank you. Okay, so these are what we uh, um, sort of foregrounded that, that uh, appeared from the work that was published in this special issue. And what I'm going to do now is to just go through each of them and to speak to um, how these principles resonated with um, what the two speakers have been speaking about. And then to pose, I suppose, some questions in relation to that uh, and, and just some thoughts. So if we look at the first one, undermining patriarchal colonialist legacy of mainstream psychological uh, science, both of our speakers, Floretta and Paling, re re referred to this. Um, and I think Floretta poignantly asked, is there a space uh, within this uh, um, discipline for the kinds of work that uh, uh, she and, and colleagues and many of us want to, to, to take up. Um, and what she is through is the fees that uh, we would have in overturning something that is deeply colonialist because disassembling these legacies and power relations are actually is actually very uh, uh, complicated partially because of their multiplicity and how uh, uh, colonial legacies don't stay the same they shift they change they appropriate um, they adapt to new circumstances and so there's a significant labor is required in the uh, uh, um, project of uh, performing decolonizations, particularly from uh, in a feminist uh, uh, manner. Um, and I want to perhaps then draw on, on two things that uh, were mentioned uh, in, uh, by both speakers. And, and this is the, the, the notions of empowerment and participation. Um, which both of which have um, a sort of ready, uh, um, they, well, they're used very readily. There uh, are terms that are thrown out in a multiple of, of, of spaces. And yet, as we speak about these important processes, and they are important, I'm reminded of two pitfalls, I suppose, around uh, these two notions. The one being uh, uh, how empowerment can start to be equated with individual self-efficacy and self-agency, which in its and of itself can then lead to the responsabilization of the very bodies, very often poor black women who are being empowered. Uh, and the social justice aspects and the collective aspects, which both speakers have spoken about in terms of trauma, can sometimes get lost. And so inspecting our uh, terms and, and, and how they can get taken up even in 
uh, uh, very conservative ways is, is, is very important. The other word, of course, participation, and I'm reminded in development work of uh, the work of Bill Cook, who talks of the tyranny of participation and, and how in, in a lot of, of development work and a lot of NGO work as well, um, participation, uh, it, 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 they say, uh, at best, Sometimes the people who are working participatory manners, so-called, are naive about the multiple power relations that operate within the particular space, or at worst, systematically reinforce rather than overthrow these inequalities. So those are just some sort of remembrances and perhaps some questions around how to work not only within what is very clear a legacy of colonialism within psychology, but also more nuanced and more invisible forms thereof. Moving on to the next one, connecting the gendered coloniality with other systems of power, such as globalization. And our speaker spoke about this very usefully about the um, binaries that crop up in terms of both coloniality and gender and how these two intermesh um, in complex and, and nuanced ways and in often in ambiguous and ambivalent ways. Um, and how, uh, as, as Pulling says, this home can simultaneously be a safe and a violent space. Um, these complexities get surfaced then in investigating particular topics that uh, show how the gendered coloniality of knowledge, power, and being play themselves out in complicated ways. And we've seen in these talks some very nice examples of um, exactly that uh, uh, and, and, and how uh, you know, for example, your COVID, the, the vaccine nationalism that goes along with it, and all the various other aspects that we've seen in terms of gender based violence. Often, that's what's new, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, it's really uh, uh, what, what as, as, as Puling has, has noted, it's put into sharper focus what actually has always been there. Moving on to using research methods that dovetail with feminist decolonizing psychology. And we've seen, again, some very nice uh, work that uh, 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 mentioned by both these speakers. Just want to highlight uh, uh, two of them. The one is the, the, the notion of embroidery. And what does embroidery mean? I mean, that's, you know, it would normally be that you go to a research 101 course and you get taught how to use embroidery <laughs> as a research tool. Um, so this kind of innovative work that uh, uh, speaks, as Pulling says so nicely, to remembering and the narrative word of remembering not, is not just about memory, but it's also about membership um, and reimagining and how those methodologies can be used. Um, the lens, turning the lens onto whiteness, white leanness, the global north, I think is, is as indicated by uh, uh, Fluetta, is another very important process in this decolonizing space. Um, it's in the interactions that happen in, these, in, the, in, in, in race, that needs to be highlighted, including the privileges that whiteliness provides. Finally, then moving on to the praxis um, and the, 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 the hub that, is, that Floretta so eloquently spoke to is not only a discursive space, but a physical space, a space of relaxation of just simply connecting with others. Pulling spoke about activist spaces, mobilizing with communities under siege. And this is very important in terms of feminist decolonizing space. It's, the, 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 it's not only the scholarship, it's the praxis of scholarships, it's the practice of activism that needs to be connected in, 
nuanced and, and uh, um, ways that indicate the how to start unraveling this gendered coloniality of knowledge, power, and being. So I will stop there and just say thank you very much to, to, to the presenters and to the organizers for this wonderful event. Thank you, uh, Professor McLeod. It's very important the way that you've unpacked and, and made meaning of these different um, principles in relation to, to what's been discussed. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move on to Professor Peace Kagua, our second respondent. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Kigua. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, thanks to the two uh, speakers, Pauline and Floretta. And thank you to Floretta as uh, to Catriona as well. Um, so it's not just a thank you for the invitation to respond to you and to imagine together with you, but it's it's actually a pleasure for me because I have followed all of your work uh, during my journey as an academic and it's it's a real honor to to engage with you. So I, I want to start um, by picking up on some stuff that Pauline, Floretta and, and Catriona have kind of left off on. And that's to start with the 1990s South, um, psychology. Uh, there was a time that we spoke about psychology and relevance. Um, so this is way before we started talking about decolonial kind of work. Uh, and so as Catriona was talking about remembrances and looking back, it's, it's brought that to mind, that these conversations have been conversations we've been having for quite a long time. Uh, and here we are today in 2021. So in some sense, I'm also picking up on the word that Pauline threw in, which is despair. Uh, I'm, I'm actually coming into this conversation with a sense of despair because the sense that I am getting is that we seem to be recycling conversations and dialogue and debates. And what I'm hoping today can be about is for us to start thinking out of that impasse as well. Uh, the other thing that Pauline did talk about is the idea of hope, uh, that the, in the midst of despair, there is hope uh, and that there can be hope. So I want to also piggyback on that but to also think about the intersectional struggles that Catriona ended off with, uh, because I am also thinking about the work of decolonial feminism in terms of the kinds of struggles that we know are happening today, uh, especially with the idea of access to education. So, so these kinds of struggles for me imply that we need to start engaging with the, the ways in which all of our struggles is intersectional. So where do I want to begin with all of this? Um, as the speakers will know, and as some of our participants would know, I have an interest in psychology, but I also have a particular interest in the idea of praxis and well-being, um, and, and wanting to think about what it means to actually engage with psychology. Floretta actually threw me for a loop when she asked, started out by asking, how does one locate oneself in a discipline with a history like ours? And that's a very serious question, Floretta. Thank you for that. So how do we locate ourselves in a discipline with the kind of history that it does? And so now I'm thinking about psychology, well-being, and praxis. So what is it that we do now? And what is it that we think decolonial work can do? Um, but more than that, what's the urgency of this work? So to my mind, the, the, the one thing that seems to connect all of these conversations seems to be this idea of the coloniality of power and its persistence. Um, and, and, and I think that's a very useful way for us to start thinking about decolonial feminist work. So I'm going to frame my response in terms of three questions and what I am getting a sense to be three kinds of responses from the conversation. Um, and my first question is, is thinking about the global South, but also thinking about Africa more broadly and, and asking the questions that I think decolonial feminists are asking, which is what are the conditions of, oppression, of our oppression as women, right? So we need to be very clear about that. Uh, but more than that, we need to also think about intersectionalities. So how do intersectionalities of race, class, sexuality, disability, geographies, and so on. How do all of these affect the way that we experience oppression, but also the way that we confront these oppressions? 
Um, and I think the bulk of psychological research has been fixated on kind of archiving the experience of oppression, but has not properly attended to the ways that these oppressions have also been confronted by the people who are experiencing them. So, so that's my first question. What exactly are the conditions of our oppression as women if we are advocating for a decolonial feminist approach and how do we work with intersectionalities? My second question is, what are this, the circumstances of our pain? Um, how has the circumstances of our pain been overlooked and remain marginal, right? Because part of what we're wanting to do is to document this. But in relation to that, I'm also asking, in what ways have our stories and our narratives also remained marginal? And so what does that mean for me in terms of engaging decolonial feminist psychology is trying to think about ways that we address this, this gap in, in, in knowledge production but also asking really important questions about who is doing the speaking, who is, who is engaging with these narratives. How do we read pain and trauma um, and healing uh, in ways and, and from perspectives that are not alienating to us? So that's part of the work of a decolonial feminism. And my last question is how do we organize? So that's the other big thing that I think we need to start thinking about. Um, to move from a kind of theorizing um, of, of our experiences and, and our identities and where we are located, but to really start thinking about the work of organizing. Uh, Floretta has spoken about organizing to change the discipline. Uh, and, and back to the question that you asked Floretta, how do we continue to locate ourselves in a discipline with the kind of history that it has? Um, and I think we need to actively think about what it means to organize, to change the discipline. But how do we also organize to survive, to heal, to remember? Uh, and so part of this is also thinking about how do we work with historical trauma? How do we work with collective trauma? But I think I want to throw in something else there as well. Uh, and that's the word that Poulain introduces, this idea of hope. So how do we work with hope? And, and, not, and not naive hope. How do we work with a critical hope? A hope that recognizes precisely where we are and, and the kinds of challenges that, that we are actually facing. And how, in many ways, how these challenges are actually insurmountable in some respects. But still, how do we work with hope? Um, and what can it look like in the face of violence, in the face of oppression, in the face of continued silencing, not just within the discipline, but also outside of it. And related to that, who does this work and what's the labor of decolonial feminist work as part of organizing? And when I say what's the labor, um, part of what I'm asking us to think through is the work of what we now popularly called diversity, but to really think about decolonial feminist work in terms of, of a labor. Um, and what goes into this labor and how do we hold spaces for us? Because we can't do it alone. So thinking in terms of these three questions, what I want to start thinking about is once again, this idea of organizing um, and, and picking up on what the two speakers have, have allowed us to think through, but hopefully in the discussion will also allow us to broaden beyond, beyond what they have offered to us. So to think about organizing. Um, and I think part of the work of organizing means that we need to seriously confront the way that we are also not the same. Right, we must confront what divides us as feminists, as psychologists, and as decolonial feminist psychologists. So we should not assume that the political necessity that brings us together can keep us together. And I think it is precisely that kind of romanticization of what it is that we do that in many ways allows us to fall by the wayside and for the projects that we, we have come together for to fall by the wayside. So how do we organize but still work with the things that divide us and, and the locations that divide us? So in terms of thinking about all those questions, I'm, I'm wanting to now try to think about a response uh, that ties together what the two speakers have said, but also I think in many ways centers my own location in terms of thinking about decolonial feminist work. The first thing is about creating community, right? And, and we need to think about what it is that communities do, but also what it is that communities can do, 
right? So this idea of imagination. Floretta has spoken beautifully about the hub, right? This is a space a community created within the academy. And Pauline has spoken about a community outside of the academy, right? So we can think creatively about communities within and outside of the academy. And I think part of the work that we do means that we break away from these kinds of binary of the academy and, and the wider community. Pauline has also spoken about holding spaces and, and in many ways Floretta has as well. Holding spaces, learning spaces, dialogical spaces, and, and thinking through the ways in which we can come together in ways that allow us to talk through our differences, but to also begin to kind of imagine um, a different way of doing psychology, a different kind of feminist psychology. It's also about research, it's about women writing, but the important question, who do we write for? And, and one of my sources of discontent in, in the academy has always been that we seem to be talking to ourselves. So how do we translate what it is that we do and that we write about, but how do we translate that in ways that allows for a conversation with a wider community? Uh, the second thing that they offer us is the idea of recentering narratives. So recentering not just in terms of knowledge, but also recentering in terms of the bodies that produce knowledge. This is very important. Um, so for a long time, we've been talking about moving away from the canon in psychology and trying to think about alternate kinds of knowledge production, alternate spaces of knowledge production. I think this is very important. Um, but we also need to talk about the bodies that produce this knowledge and how do we think through uh, a lot more democratic ways of learning from each other. Uh, and, and the examples that Floretta provides in terms of the work that the hub is doing is a very wonderful way to think through some of this. And then lastly, the idea of knowing, and particularly the methodologies of knowing. The work that we do, uh, not just in terms of theory, but how we choose to undertake research, what methodologies we work with asking ourselves, how do our current methodologies fail us? Uh, what erasures happen via the methodologies that we insist on, on using in our research, in our, in our explorations? Um, so it's not enough to just imagine, we need to also think about the tools that we take up as part of this reimagining. So what possibilities for new kinds of methodologies to grow? Um, and, and really asking what is the promise of a decolonial feminist psychology on a broader scale? Uh, what is the promise of an African feminist psychology on a broader scale outside of the academy? So it's always about outside of the academy and how do we do that? Uh, and, and I think I've, I've, I might have posed more questions than answers, but I, I you know me well enough by now to know that that's precisely what I will do. Um, and I will leave it here and open up for discussions with the panelists, but also with, with the participants who have joined us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pakigua. Thank you for your reflections and for really weaving together all the ideas and the threads um, of the session um, in, in such a powerful way. And thank you for your questions and for challenging us. I think that this leads beautifully into the discussion to follow. Thank you very much. So we'll now open space um, before the Q&A. Uh, Milika, Milika will be facilitating that. Thank you, Milika. Thank you very much from, from my side as well it, for this rich conversation. Um, it evoked so many questions for me as a you know, as a white researcher doing um, work on race um, and how to position yourself ethically in this work, but I will um, refrain from asking my own questions first. Um, I do want to just say there was a question about the reading list. Um, some of the attendees are interested in having this information, so we will post that together with the actual webinar Hopefully in about a week's time, we will post that together and it will all be on Historical Trauma and Transformations website. Um, so I believe we have one um, from person from the audience who is going to come on live, but before he does, um, I thought to maybe just open the floor with a, a question for all of the presenters today, 
I think um, many of you spoke to this issue already, but it was asked by Jade Gibson, does challenging the canon of the discipline of psychology lead to a redefinition of the discipline itself? Is the concept of the discipline itself problematic, particularly when it intersects with other disciplines? How then would one redefine psychology as a discipline? Um, so this is for all or for any of you, if, if you want to jump in and, and also use the opportunity to maybe respond to, to your colleagues, what has been said already. Um, maybe just to guide this, I don't know, Floretta, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, I can, I can offer um, some kind of response um, to Jade. Uh, uh, thank you for that. For that question, Jade, I think um, uh, I think part of the the, the job is challenging the pro the disciplinarity in a sense, right? Um, because of course, you know, the ways in which I guess disciplines were created excludes particular groups of people, right? Um, and so. Um, Part of the project, I think, of decolonization, yes, definitely is challenging um, disciplinarity. Um, but at the same time, there's also the job of kind of building an archive, which is what I think um, we are, those of us who, I mean, we work both inside and outside of our disciplines. I think that work is also necessary, right? So the kind of, in a sense, um, transdisciplinarity, but also out, outside of disciplines, right? Um, which means also work outside of the academy. Um, but, uh, but we are also building an archive, right? In kind of the work that we're doing, um, we're building a different archive. And so our year piece in um, <laughs> the despair, <laughs> Um, which, I mean, we, we and, and we feel that, I mean, those of us who do feminist work and work on questions of violence, we feel that often, um, the despair, but, but there is that radical hope and the critical hope, right? Um, and, um, and, and, so, and so we have to think of this in terms of how it will shape itself into the future. So how the work that we're doing with our students now, you know, the, the, um, the, stu the ways in which people are writing now about psychology, about embroidery, about finding different ways of working, you know, within this discipline that disciplines us is, is an archive for, for, for future generations um, and will change the face of what psychology looks like, you know. I mean, you know, when I started in psychology, there was no, you know, feminist, there was feminist psychology, there wasn't decolonial psychology, and, and now we have a body of work that um, we can draw on that our students are so. So that's, yeah, that would be my response to um, the question. Thank you. Thank you, Floretta. Um, Pauline, would you like to go next? Um, okay, thank you, Maleka. Um, I think as Floretta said, you know, disciplines were created to, to do exactly that, to discipline us, to, to make us to be, experts in a particular field that is very directed um, towards a particular way of knowing and being in the world. Um, and, and many decolonial scholars have written about the challenges of the, uh, uh, what they call this disciplinary decadence, right? We, we, we only focused on our disciplines um, and, and at the exclusion of other disciplines. So the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary ways of looking uh, at, at people's experiences at understanding the world is something that has for a long time not been privileged. So um, yes, there is a need to really rethink the ways in which uh, the canon is, is, is structured, the ways in which our universities are structured. Does it mean doing away with psychology? Not necessarily. It, it means, um, you know, taking psychology and making it look at itself and look at uh, some of the challenges that, 
um, it has contributed towards um, how, how psychology in many ways was also part of the colonizing uh, agenda, the colonizing project and, and the problematic history that psychology has and actually engage with that, but also opening up psychology uh, to be in conversation more explicitly with other disciplines. So, so we need to, to move away to, to have the, 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 the disobedience in terms of how um, we look at our disciplines. And I think that the decolonization agenda is, is, is attempting to do that and forcing us to do that, to say we need to, to, to pull our discipline apart, to, to challenge our discipline. And, and in doing that, then we can see how much politics there is in psychology, how much sociology there is in psychology, um, and, and how much history there is in psychology. And therefore, how can we do psychology without acknowledging all these other interdisciplinary influences in the discipline itself? And I think for me, uh, the decolonization agenda forces us to do that. It requires us to move towards that rethinking of our discipline. Thank you very much, Puling. Um, Catriona, would you like to respond to that question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm just following up on what um, Puling has said. I remember doing a presentation once at, at, at my university and one of the sociology professors coming up to me and saying, you're just a wannabe sociologist, aren't you? Um, and so, and, and in some respects, yes. Um, but my kind of uh, position on all of this is that I insist that what I'm doing is psychology, but I'm stretching it. I'm insisting on stretching it, um, along with a whole lot of other people, because obviously our work intermeshes and we speak to each other, we dialogue, etc. But what I want to draw attention to here in terms of this particular question is um, that uh, I think it was the sort of uh, second bullet point of, of, of analyzing what we're doing within other power systems. And we must understand that the discipline of psychology is located within other power systems, one of which is the system of higher education and research funding and, and research dating and all of those kinds of things. And, and, and then the praxis of psychology is located within the uh, strictures put on us by the professional board and the definitions that people have of particular modes of practicing and who can do what kinds of practicing. And in all of those, we need to be able to inspect those power structures and to understand how do we fit within those power structures. And if we are fitting within those power structures, what does that mean in terms of the implications of the work that we do? So in terms of my own particular uh, 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 decisions around that, because we all have to make decisions about where we locate ourselves and how we operate, my own decision around this and the own the, the kind of disobedience that Puling has just spoken to is that I will not be I, I, I deregistered and will never register with the professional board again. Because my cynical view is that the professional board is only there, you only need to be registered with a professional board if you want to charge medical aid um, or if you want to work for the state. The kind of psychology that I want to do, which is much more kind of uh, collaborative, it is much more uh, uh, stepping outside of the sort of usual bounds of psychology, is doesn't need that kind of legitimation. And so it doesn't bother me at all. I've stepped outside of that situation completely. I have not stepped outside of the research rating uh, 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 juggernaut. And that's another juggernaut. It's a terrible juggernaut in some respects because it focuses on an individual as opposed to a collective. And that is a very, I think, difficult and, 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 and it, you know, no research is ever individual. Um, and but so 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 I I do that with uh, um, knowledge that that enables me, even though it's not a good system. I don't think it enables me to do the work because I can get funding. So it's quite cynical in a sense. But I've engaged with that power uh, 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 
juggernaut, I suppose, uh, in, in that. So anyway, those are just personal examples of, of how one has to kind of stretch and kind of mold yourself and make decisions about how you, we, we, we practice within this broader kind of power relations that, that restrict us and also provide opportunities. Thank you very much for that, Catriona. Certainly academia is, is not for the faint-hearted, is it? <laughs> um, Peace, would you like to also um, address that question about psychology? Um, yes, uh, so I, I think in terms of what we dis dis think about as part of the project, what it is that we, we, we want to do, it, you're definitely correct. We need to challenge disciplinarity we need to put psychology into conversation with other disciplines because quite honestly, that the exceptionalism that we have given to ourselves is, is not warranted. But I also agree with Floretta. I think part of what it is we need to be very careful about doing is to move away from the project of building an archive within the discipline. Um, so as much as I would advocate that we engage psychology outside of psychology i'm also wanting us to think about what it is that we do as psychologists and and in, and let's think in terms of the actual practicalities who are the students that we select into our programs this, this is part of the process there's a politics of selection here so we need to critically think about what it is that we do and and think about what it is that we teach what it is that we produce when we say this is what well-being looks like Right, and this is the model of well-being and healing. So I think I would advocate that we engage with that disciplinarity and that flow outside. But I would also want us to take seriously the project of building an archive within the discipline, to say this is the history of psychology and this is what we want to change, so that the generation to come think, look back, and see this is what psychological history looked like and this is what it can look like and this is. This is how it can evolve. Thank you very much, Peace. Um, we are almost nearing the end of the webinar, but I'm going to, to ask more question, one more question for, um, for Ling. It's, it's a somewhat more practical question. Um, Haley asked, Prof. Sahalo, how might we as Black researchers based in university settings engage communities in the way you suggest? given that when we come back from university, we are already othered as if we were white and imbued with the coloniality of the institutions that train us. What do we do with the hierarchies of communal life when we come back as researchers? Willing, um, that was a question for you. Mm. No, thank you very much. That, that is, uh, you're right, a very practical question, a very difficult one, and it goes back to the ways in which our education system has for a long time and continues to, to alienate us from our communities. Um, the fact that the, the, the Euro Western uh, kind of education um, that we get when we go to school, that when we go home, we appear very different. We, 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 we look uh, black outside, but we speak white um, and, and, and we, we do things as if we were white. That is, that is often the perception in the communities already tells you um, that we're having a huge problem because then if we are dealing with an education system that does that, how are we even going to be able to go back to the communities and do the work that is necessary for social change uh, and social justice in the communities? So um, I, th there is no recipe in terms of how one does it, but I think it comes with humility um, uh, Peace spoke about the coloniality of power. There is already that power um, that, that one is assumed to have when you come from uh, the university going into in the, the communities because of uh, the long-term distancing between communities and our universities. So I think um, one goes into the community with humility and you build that trust uh, with the community. It, it, it's, it's work, it's work that one has to do because it was also a lot of work that the university has done to, to actually alienate us from our community. So we also need to do that work um, when we go into the communities to be able to, 
to humble ourselves and acknowledge the knowledges that are in the communities in working with our communities. And, and, and it, does, it does work because when, when people feel that they can trust you um, and, they, and they see themselves in you, I'm not sure how to say that, um, then they are able to, to work with you. And so I think going forward, hence it's important for this decolonizing project to happen within the universities, in the ways in which the university it will assist in terms of the ways in which the university is perceived by the communities because the universities will be part of the community. And, and if that happens, then this divide, I hope, um, will be more and more and more narrowed as time goes. And then we can actually work together with alongside our communities. Mm. Thank you very much, Puling, for answering that in such a beautiful way. Um, I think we have reached the end of our time. Um, Samantha, I, I do want to give you a last opportunity. Do you want to say anything else? Do you have a question for, for our panelists? Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much to the panelists for, for really sharing the insights so powerfully today. Um, hopefully we can continue um, this discussion on other platforms, uh, share some of the questions with the presenters um, and, and, and really have further dialogue around this. Uh, Milika, you're welcome to give my question to someone in the audience who I know really wants to ask it. So please go ahead and ask one more question. Okay, um, let's, let's do Anita Bester's question, um, which is not a small question. She asked, I would like to ask how apartheid affected gender-based violence. I hear that dehumanizing, dehumanization had an immense impact on gender-based violence during the colonial period. However, how did the dehumanizing increase gender-based violence, was it specific regimes from apartheid or was it the stress it imposed onto black families? Is there a similar pattern between gender-based violence during apartheid and during COVID-19 at the moment? So that was not for any um, particular uh, panelist, but it, it also speaks to the, the current pandemic that we're experiencing. Um, I think Puleng, you spoke powerfully about that and, and how gender-based violence has flared up in the last year. So I'm going to um, leave it to any one of you who maybe gives me a heads up if you want to um, address that question. Uh, Floretta, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I won't obviously fully address the question because it's a big one. I'm, I'm trying to go back to see if I can read it. But um, um, I think the question about um, gender-based violence during apartheid is, um, is a question, is to say that, you know, um, uh, Black women's experiences of violence were not um, the apartheid state was not interested in black women's experiences of violence, right? Um, so in terms of uh, uh, violence from partners or um, violence from white men um, uh, or, or violence from others in, in their community. So, so it really was not of interest to the apartheid state. So I think, um, I think we need to um, carefully interrogate our assumptions about violence. And that's part of the, um, the work that Puleng was talking about and part of the work that we, we are kind of like talking about here broadly, but is to unpack the history and the looking back and the, and the thinking about um, who is violent and why, who is most at, I mean, in, in, in popular discourse, and in the ways in which we write about violence in the academy, you know, who is considered to be most at risk of being a victim of violence, who is considered to be most at risk of perpetrating violence. And so earlier when I spoke about violence, um, gender based violence as having a black face, you know, th we need to interrogate that. So the question is, how did we get here? You know, how did we get to the point where um, uh, yeah, where, 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 where gender-based violence has become racialized. And so I think um, narratives about 
the um, the the impact of apartheid um, need to be interrogated for the ways in which it contributes to a particular discourse about who is violent. And then, of course, it silences a whole, you know, it, it silences um, a whole host of other kinds of, of violence. Um, and so that question um, that Katrina picked up on about turning the lens back onto whiteness um, and thinking about violence in relation to that um, is also for me part of the project. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think this is a big, big question that uh, requires much more time than we have. Mm. Thank you very much, Floretta. I am going to just allow um, one of the other panelists, if, if either of you um, wants to respond, maybe you can just give me an indication. Um, Catriona, you're welcome. Thanks. I think just following on from Florida is the, the idea also, what I see more and more in scholarship now is a, a kind of extending of the notion of violence, which can have its disadvantages as well, because it might undermine the, the sort of severity of violence. But when we start talking about epistemic violence, for example, there's some lovely work being done around obstetric violence, reproductive violence, um, how, for example, uh, you know, black, black women in particular, uh, um, disabled women, women with disabilities, living with disabilities, are coerced into uh, uh, um, you know, particular modes of using contraception or even sterilized. So those, you know, and how those connect all up together, they form a big picture. It's not an isolated incident of, 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 of you know, being beaten up or you know, gender-based actual violence and how these various forms of inequities and violence kind of mesh into each other historically and currently. Um, to reinforce a, 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 the jigsaw puzzle that remains in place. And it seems to be so incredibly difficult to, to, to um, undo. So I think it's that nuance and the complexities that we're seeing in the scholarship that is very heartening at the moment. Thank you very much, Katriona. And with that, I'm going to end our webinar. We um, have made a commitment to our panelists and also to, your, to our audience to stick to an hour and a half because we want you back every month. <laughs> um, so with that also a reminder for our next webinar on the 14th of April, um, please watch our website. And also if you, if you signed up with your email address, you will receive these reminders. So yes, thank you very much. That was such a wonderful all-female cast that we had for our first webinar. Um, and yeah, let's continue the conversations afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.